While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There, he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about twelve men in all. Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and the evil spirits left them. Some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you, come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the evil, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. After all this had happened, Paul decided to go to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. After I have been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. He he sent two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia, while he stayed in the province of Asia a little longer. About that time, there arose a great disturbance about the way. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together, along with the workers in related trades, and said, You know, my friends, that we, have, that we receive in good income from this business. And you see in here how this fellow Paul had convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. There is danger not only that our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of our great goddess Artemis will be discredited. And the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty. When they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, Great is the Artemis of, of the Ephesians. Soon, the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not even know why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front, and they shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, Great is the Artemis of the Ephesians. The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there, and there are proconsuls. They can press charges. If, if there is anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it is, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. After 
He had said that he dismissed the assembly. The title of my message is Paul's ministry in Ephesus. A subtitle I take, took it as a daily discussion at the, at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. So in his second missionary journey, Paul stopped by Ephesus briefly. So Ephesus was one of the most important cities in the Roman Empire and the leading city of Asia Minor. It was a port city and crossroads, both land and sea commerce. And he boasted a magnificent temple dedicated to the goddess Artemis, the fertility goddess. Its Roman name is Diana. This temple was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, together with the great, great pyramid of Gaza, Giza, and the hanging gardens of Babylon, and the statues of Zeus of Olympia, and, and uh, several others. Around this temple swarmed tradesmen and prostitutes who made their living from the temple business. Paul visited the synagogue there and shared the gospel, but he could not stay very long, but he promised to come back. Then on this third missionary journey, Paul did come back. And Acts chapter 19 is about his exciting ministry in Ephesus. He remained in Ephesus for two years and three months, the longest in any of the cities in his missionary journey. And this time was a pivotal point in his mission life. The lecture hall of Tyrannus was the final grand strategy used by Paul to reach two million people in two years with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He turned the world upside down. Many people repented of sorcery and burned the scrolls, which valued at $7 million in today's value. Paul never had such an opportunity to do it again. It was his grand finale, because soon after, at about age 54, he visited Jerusalem with an offering for poor people and was unjustly arrested, held for two years as a prisoner, and then sent to Rome for trial and death. But it was at Ephesus, Paul had a vision for world evangelization through Rome. And he said, I must visit Rome also. Uh, first, the work of God began with the 12 disciples. As Paul surveyed Ephesus, he found some disciples, but they looked strange. They had no joy, and they looked always condemned. They went around saying, what a wretched man I am, like Paul in Romans chapter 7. They admitted that they were sinners. They knew they deserved God's righteous judgment, but they did not know the marvelous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. They did not know that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That means that they never experienced the freedom from sin in Jesus Christ. So it's most likely that they were disciples of Apollos. Remember in the last chapter, last week, the Priscilla and Aquila helped Apollos to know Jesus more adequately. So these disciples also had an incomplete understanding of Jesus Christ. So Paul asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they answered. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So when Paul asked, so listen carefully. When Paul asked, did you receive the Holy Spirit? In Greek, there is no article, the, the Holy Spirit. So when there is an article, the, it refers to the person of the Holy Spirit. But when there is no article, the, it refers to the power of the Holy Spirit. So Paul is not asking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He's asking about the power of the Holy Spirit. They did not experience the dynamite power of the Holy Spirit. They did not experience the feeling of the Holy Spirit. 
So we can see the same in Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Jesus said, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Again, in Greek, there is no the Holy Spirit. It's without the article the. So Jesus is asking not about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is asking us to pray, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. So when I come to Jesus, you should pray that we will be teachable by the Holy Spirit. We will be guided by the Holy Spirit. And His power will be poured out on us in our service for Christ. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? They replied, John's baptism. So listen carefully. There is a difference between being baptized for washing away your sins and being baptized in the name of Jesus. Being baptized in, in the name of Jesus means that we identify ourselves with his death, burial, and his resurrection. So when you go under the water, our old self crucified and buried. And when you come up out of the water, we rise with Christ to live a new life in him. So when you go under water, you have to leave behind your old self. So when you are baptized, you have to ask yourself, what you are going to leave behind in your old self. So they were rebaptized. They were already baptized, but they were rebaptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Paul placed his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on them. And then when they were baptized, they spoke in tongues and prophesied. They were filled with the power and joy. They could speak about God and his marvelous work. They could see the coming of the kingdom of God. And it was the beginning of God's great work in Ephesus. These 12 disciples, together with Paul, turned the world upside down. Isn't it interesting? Jesus began his work with the 12 disciples and turned the world upside down. And Paul, together with the 12 disciples, turned the world upside down. And second daily Bible study, in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. So Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Kingdom of God is where God reigns. God sent Jesus to this world as king. Jesus restores God's reign in this world in the house of man. To accept the kingdom of God is to accept Jesus as our king. To those accepting Jesus is the savior who drives our sin, death, and the evil. Jesus rules us with the peace, joy, and the love of God. And God, Jesus gives the eternal life to those who accept him as king. And Jesus gives us the heaven as our eternal home. But those who reject Jesus cannot escape the rule of the devil. After about three months, some of the Jews in the synagogue rejected the gospel and publicly maligned the way. The way here was the early name for Christianity, for those who follow Jesus. The Christian faith is not just belief in certain doctrines and teachings. It is a way of life. That's why Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. So following Jesus is a new way of life. And the Romans knew the followers of Jesus by this name, the way. So remember in chapter 9, Paul had conducted search and destroy mission against those who belong to the way. Here in Ephesus, Paul made disciples and trained them to walk in the way of Jesus. When Jews rejected the gospel, Paul did not despair. He did not, they, they refused to listen. So in Luke at verse 9, he took the disciples with him and a discussion daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Paul started the Bible school and encourage discussion. He did not preach one-sidedly. Anyone could ask questions. Some may have presented the ideas of scholars of the day, but then Paul shared with them 
the truth of the gospel. And in the end, the gospel remains the people's hearts as the absolute truth of God that stands uh, forever. Because the gospel is the only way of salvation which God has given to man. Here, so I want to emphasize Paul's use of the lecture hall of Tyrannus. It is quite remarkable. See, in those days, they started work at sunrise until 11 a.m. Then at 11 a.m., the city stopped work for lunch and for a long siesta, you know, because the weather is so hot and there is no air conditioning. So according to historians, at 1 p.m., there were probably more people sound asleep than at 1 a.m. But Paul did not sleep in the daytime. So until 11 a.m., he would work in his tent making business. And then Tyrannus would give his lectures. So there are a lot of debate about who this Tyrannus is. But let's say he's a Greek philosopher. So he would give lectures until 11 a.m. But at 11 a.m., Tyrannus would go to rest and for lunch, and the lecture room would be empty and the rent is cheaper because nobody was using it. So instead of resting, Paul exchanged leather work for lecture work, continuing for five hours, stopping only at 4 p.m. when the work was resumed in the city. So they would resume the work at 4 p.m. until sunset, maybe around 8 or 9 p.m. So assuming that the apostle kept one day in seven for worship and rest, he will have given a daily five-hour lecture six days a week for two years, which makes 3,120 hours of gospel lectures. So look at verse 10. During the time, all of Asia Minor was pioneered. All the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. They say that two million people in the province of Asia were reached through Paul's ministry. Especially a man named Epaphras was converted and went to pioneer the church in Colossae. People traveled throughout Ephesus from all over the world to the cities of Asia Minor. In Revelation, John reports on the seven churches that were possibly the fruit of this ministry. In addition to Ephesus and Colossae, there were Pergamon, Smyrna, Smyrna Pergamon, Theatra, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Seven churches in Revelation. So look at verses 11 and 12. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. God did these miracles through Paul to authenticate his gospel message. God wanted people to believe the gospel and be saved. And here, the, the pieces of material were those which probably Paul used in his tent-making business. The sweat rags for tying around his head and the aprons for tying around his waist. We can imagine that this happening at first almost by accident. Perhaps a person in need of healing took a handkerchief from Paul in a superstitious manner and was healed. And then he became a pattern that others imitate. As we see later, that the Ephesians were quite superstitious. And so people uh, took this as a, a usual manner that they were healed through Paul. Third, Paul's vision for Rome. Something very interesting happened through, during Paul's ministry in Ephesus, seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, went around driving out evil spirits. They tried to invoke the name Jesus' name as though it was a magic word to drive out evil spirits. Then something happened that revealed true power and unique nature of Jesus. So one day the evil spirit answered them saying, Jesus I know, I know about Paul, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. The people of Ephesus realized that the evil spirits were real and dangerous. Yet the evil spirits were afraid of Jesus. 
the people were all seized with the fear and held Jesus' name in high honor. Jesus' light shone into the darkness, and the darkness fled before it. These hidden in darkness were compressed openly. Sorcery scrolls were burned publicly. The value of the scrolls were 50,000 drachmas, about $7 million today. The word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. So you can say today's sorcery scrolls are like a fortune telling business, like a horoscope and palm reading. Many people dismiss such things as a superstition, but they are quite as just as popular today among young people. I read that many Gen Zs, MZ generation, they they take quite seriously. It shows their fear and insecurity, and it led them to idol worshiping. When Paul saw God's work, he was sure that Ephesus had been fully pioneered. Now it was time to move on. So he decided to go to Jerusalem and then to Rome. As the book of Romans explains, he went to Jerusalem to take an offering from the Gentile churches to the Jerusalem church. Paul wanted the Gentiles to acknowledge their spiritual death to the Jews. And he wanted the Jews to embrace the Gentiles with a world mission vision. Paul wanted to unite the Christian church and inspire it to march forward for the sake of world mission. So that's why Paul said, I must visit Rome also. Rome, Rome was the superpower of the nation of the time. The same, all roads lead to Rome could be taken literally because it was true at the time. All roads did lead to Rome, which was located at the center of the vast Roman Empire. From there, Roman influence spread out to the four corners of the world. As a result, Rome was both loved and hated by the nations. People resented Roman imperialism and Roman law. But at the same time, they esteemed all types of Roman technology, which was easily the most advanced of its time. But God had a plan to use Roman influence, not to spread Roman technology or Roman culture or no Roman imp imperialism, but to spread the word of God. Paul believed that God would conquer Rome with the gospel as he had done in Ephesus. Paul was burning with the vision to spread the gospel to the whole world through the Roman rule. That's what he said in Romans chapter 15. But now there is now no more place for me to walk in these regions. And since I have been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. They say Spain is the like uh, end of the world in their belief because Spain is the end the edge. They didn't know that there is America. So this vision was the fruit of his lifetime obedience to the Holy Spirit. So when we obey God's leading and give our hearts to God's work, God will lead us to have a great vision for world mission. And lastly, fourth, God protects his servants. As God's work was flourishing, the devil attacked God's work through a selfish silversmith named Demetrius. Demetrius appealed to efficient craftsmen and citizens on the basis of their bank accounts, their civic pride, and sentimental attachment to their religion. He manipulated them into an emotional frenzy. They rushed as one man into a theater shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So Artemis is uh, the statues like that. So he's a goddess of fertility. And Demetrius made a lot of money making this statue and selling them. But when they believed, they stopped buying. And so Demetrius' business suffered greatly. And most of people did not know why they were there. So here Luke wants us to think about the real source of evil and chaos. It is the devil walking through selfish people like Demetrius. So later Paul wrote, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. People who love money more than God 
becomes the devil's agents. They cause trouble for many innocent people. So here, Luke, the author, encourages us to see the money motive behind the chaotic events. So it is interesting that even today, journalists and detectives are taught to follow the money in solving mysteries. So that's why entertainment industry and alcohol and marijuana business, especially porn industry, hates Christianity. Because people, when people believe in Jesus, people stop using such, such things and their business suffer as a result. So in the midst of danger, Paul was not frightened. He wanted to address the crowd, but many co-workers begged him not to do so. Finally, city clock appealed to the crowd on the basis of law, and he reminded them that there was no reason for their gathering, and they were in danger of being charged with the rioting by the Roman government. After speaking these words, he dismissed the assembly. And God protected Paul and his servants and the gospel ministry. So in conclusion, the whole of Tyrannus was the Paul's last, biggest, boldest, and most successful strategic venture. It is the model we can follow, namely, what is a Tyrannus strategy? Focusing on discipleship training through discussion. So we call this Tyrannus strategy. This is a fine strategy for the great university and capital cities of the world like Toronto. If the gospel is reasonably, systematically, thoroughly unfolded in the city center, visitors will hear it and embrace it and take it back with them to their home. So through this strategy, we pray to reach 7 million people in greater Toronto areas. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, as Paul used trainer strategy to reach 2 million people in Asia Minor, we pray that we may reach 7 million people of GTA with the gospel of Jesus Christ through trainer strategy. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen.